The Freedom Rally scores another victory as the Conservative Party of Canada dumps their liberal light leader, Aaron O'Toole. What's next for the Conservative Party of Canada? I'm Candice Malcolm, and this is The Candice Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. So ever since the news broke that a freedom convoy was heading to Ottawa, to the Canadian Parliament, to the capital of Canada, to protest against government overreach, to protest against mandates specifically on truckers, but also just generally protest against government overreach, the suspension of our charter over the past two years, that th- it really has galvanized the country in support of these truckers. And let me just say, the truckers are winning. I, I know that the media is working in overtime to try try to smear them, to try to derail them, to try to discredit them. But I think more and more people are tuning out from that noise and more and more people are focusing on the task at hand, which is getting our country back, getting back on track with freedom. And we are seeing little victories along the way. And so I think that, you know, a couple of big victories that we saw, Quebec announced that it was going to drop its absurd, ridiculous decision that it had announced earlier that it was going to add an additional tax to unvaccinated people. So the vax tax is gone. That is a victory. Saskatchewan came out and announced that they were lifting all of their restrictions. The restrictions are gone. They are now living with COVID. It is an endemic. It is not a pandemic. Manitoba likewise announced that they are loosening their restrictions. And Alberta announced that the restrictions in that province will soon be gone. We are hearing more and more voices coming out opposing lockdowns, including Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown, former leader of the PC party in Ontario, which is significant because... This guy used to run the run the party. This guy used to run the party that Doug Ford now runs. And he's out there really vocally saying, let's put an end to these lockdowns. We've seen public opinion polling. So that report came out that 54% of Canadians agree with the truckers. They want all restrictions gone. They want people who are sick to take responsibility for themselves, personal responsibility to isolate, stay home. People who are vulnerable, personal responsibility, protect yourselves, no more lockdowns. And there was this really, really interesting study that came out from Johns Hopkins University. We covered it over at tnc.news at True North. And they basically said that lockdowns didn't work. This is the most comprehensive study that we have seen to this point. I'm just going to read a bit from it because it is really something. It is really something. So here is a headline over at TNC. It says, lockdowns did not reduce COVID mortality rates, according to Johns Hopkins researchers. Johns Hopkins is one of the best research universities in the world. So a groundbreaking report from Johns Hopkins University researchers has concluded that lockdowns did little to nothing when it came to reducing COVID-19 mortality rates and instead had devastating effects on the social and economic fabric of our society. The study titled A Literature Review of Meta-Analysis of the Effects of Lockdowns on COVID-19 Mortality reviewed 18,590 research reports to arrive at its conclusion. Like I said, I think this is the most comprehensive review that we have seen so far. Lockdowns were defined as at least one compulsory non-pharmaceutical intervention, including limiting internal movement, school and business closures, bans on international travel, and more. Overall, we conclude that lockdowns are not an effective way of reducing mortality rates during a pandemic, at least not during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, researchers wrote. In Edmonton, Canada, isolation and quarantine were instituted. Public meetings were banned. Schools, churches, colleges, theaters, and other public gatherings were closed and business hours were restricted without obvious impact on the epidemic. So no, lockdowns do not work. We, we're seeing more and more evidence that all of the things that the liberals said that that were science, that you had to follow the science, you had to listen to the science. If you weren't, it was because you were wrong, because you were stupid, because you hated liberalism and modernity. Uh, all of those slurs are proving to be wrong. At this point, it's so obvious. We know that the vaccines don't stop the spread of COVID. That is why all these people who are triple vaccinated, including our own Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, have COVID. So the whole justification for these lockdowns and specifically the vaccine mandates, that the the idea that you can't go to restaurants or movie theaters are in public if you're not vaccinated because you could spread COVID, that's just not true because everyone can spread COVID. It doesn't matter if you're vaccinated or not. And here we see that the the, the big solution proposed by governments across Canada to a lockdown, well, it didn't actually save lives. So shame on everyone who are pushing these things. It is time to end this thing. It is time to do what the truckers want us to do and end the pandemic, go back to life as normal, as they are doing in so many countries around the world, the UK, most of Scandinavia, most US states now. It's like Canada is the one holdout here, just gripping on to the power of forcing citizens uh, to, to comply and do things. And Canadians are standing up, saying enough is enough. 
Now, I want to cover this sort of big story of the day here. The conservatives have removed their leader, Aaron O'Toole. So we covered this in depth here at True North. I did my show on Tuesday, sort of leading up to it. I talked to a bunch of MPs off the record to sort of get the get the feeling on the ground, get the pulse of the party and what was going to happen. It was pretty obvious to me after talking to those MPs and after putting that report out that, that O'Toole was finished, that this was a foregone conclusion. He was going to be removed. And that is pretty much exactly how it played out. Uh, my colleagues and I, uh, myself, Andrew Lawton and Harley Sims, we jumped on a live yesterday. And so you can go find that and see all of our reaction. We, we recorded the show live at one o'clock. So like five minutes after we learned that Aaron O'Toole was getting removed. So you can see um, all of that analysis and uh, reaction in that video there. But I'll just kind of go through a little bit of what happened. So, so, so there was that letter, 35 MPs initiated this saying, let's review this guy's leadership. Let's get him out right now. So in response, Aaron O'Toole put out a pretty firm letter saying, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to fight for my job. And this is my party. I want to continue to lead it. Obviously, he hadn't really read and had a good understanding of where the MPs were at that point, because I think that letter just turned more people against him. It was it was pretty divisive. And basically, he was calling the, the people in the party that were going against him uh, angry and divisive and extreme. And then he was leaking stories to the CBC and the Toronto Star, saying that the people who wanted him gone were like this anti-LGBT coalition within the party. Well, that's pretty devastating uh, to say about your own party on the way out. He kind of had a change of tone, change of heart, because we had the story in the global news saying that O'Toole tells his MPs he's open to changing policies if he survives the caucus revolt, which had a lot of people chuckling. It's a little bit ironic. O'Toole was known as a conservative leader who didn't really stand for anything. He flip-flopped on almost every single issue he ever talked about. He ran as being a true blue conservative in the leadership race, and then he presented himself as a liberal during the election campaign and flip-flopped on like every major issue. And I'm not even exaggerating, uh, be it carbon tax, defunding the CBC, his position on firearms, his position on mandates, his position on balancing the budget, like anything you can think of policy wise, O'Toole has had both positions. He, he, he's a flip flopper. And so him coming out saying, hey, guys, I'm open to changing my policies if you let me stay just reemphasize all the reasons why so many people wanted him gone. He couldn't make up his mind. He couldn't, he didn't stand for anything. He couldn't articulate his, his views. He didn't have conviction. He didn't really believe in anything. And politicians who don't believe in anything are never going to stand up uh, for what is right. They, 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 they're always going to look to the polls to figure out what they should, where they should stand on position. And then when you have something like the Freedom Convoy coming into town, representing the working class and the people that the conservatives should be representing. But then you have the fancy people in the media saying, no, 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 these people are bad. It, it, it emphasized, again, O'Toole's biggest flaws is that he couldn't make a decision. He always had to look at the pools in order to guide him as to where to stand, where he stood on an issue. He didn't have time. And so he waffled and flip-flopped on the trucker issue. And by that point, it was like, okay, this guy has to go. He doesn't even know what he stands for. So again, a little bit a little bit sad that, that at the point where here we were on Tuesday evening, it was pretty clear that O'Toole was going to get removed move from office. And he's basically begging and pleading for his job, saying anything, he'll do anything. Um, more stories along those lines saying uh, Aaron O'Toole was calling MPs and leaving voicemails, promising an earlier leadership than August 2023 if they vote to keep him on. It's interesting because after the election in 2021, when O'Toole lost, and he, and he lost ground for the conservatives, like they lost, they, they won the popular vote against Trudeau, that's great, but they lost their share of the popular vote. They lost a bunch of seats, including in sort of target areas in around Toronto and Vancouver. O o O'Toole's strategy was to run as a liberal in order to win over voters in big cities, in urban areas like Toronto and Vancouver, and yet he didn't gain any ground. He didn't gain any ground in Quebec. He lost seats. So, so O'Toole lost the election, but afterwards he came out as if he had won. He was he came across really arrogant, uh, really sure of himself. He was continuing to malign conservatives. He had that line saying that conservatives have to have the courage to change, and a lot of people took that to heart because I think. It seemed like what he was saying was that the courage to change to become more liberal, more progressive, and they didn't want to hear that. And we didn't really see a lot of reconciliation, a lot of humility from O'Toole at that point. I'm talking about in September and October after the election. And then all of a sudden, here he is at the 11th hour saying that he's open to changing, saying that he'll have a leadership review earlier, uh, making all the concessions that probably if he had made right after the election, he would have continued to be leader. However, at this point, it was just too little, too late. So... 
Wednesday morning, we have the vote to remove Aaron O'Toole. It took a lot longer than people thought. It's, it's supposed to start at 9 o'clock, and we were supposed to get the results by like 11. In, instead, it sort of turned into this long, drawn-out affair. Now, this was completely off the record. It was a private meeting, and it was done virtually, so MPs were on their computers. So we don't know exactly what happened in the room because it wasn't public. But according to leaks that came out from MPs and journalists that were talking to people, basically it got drawn out because... MPs were making speeches for and against O'Toole. O'Toole made a passionate plea, basically begging for his job and saying that he wanted to stay. But again, too little, too late. So finally, at around 1245 in the afternoon on Thursday, members voted and we were told that the final tally was 73 to 45. So it wasn't even close. Conservatives voted to remove Aaron O'Toole, fire him from his position, and he is no longer the leader of the party. Later in the day, it took took all night, basically, but the Conservatives elected an interim leader who is going to be Candace Bergen, the MP from Manitoba. She's fantastic, by the way. I sort of wish that she would run for leader of the party, but I think she'll make a great a great interim leader in the meantime while they continue to search for a new leader. So that's the big question on everyone's mind. Who is going to replace Aaron O'Toole? Well, we haven't really heard a lot yet, but there's lots of lots of speculation. I think the front runner, the first person on everyone's mind is Pierre Polyev. Pierre Polyev is a fighter. He has so many of the skills that Aaron O'Toole did not, right? When I was talking about conviction and being sure of yourself, being confident, being able to decide where you stand on an issue without reading the polls and without caring about what the elites in the legacy media have to say. Pierre is just that. He is incredibly well-spoken. He is fierce. He believes in what he says. He knows where he stands on issues. And you can see him. You saw him out at the Freedom Rally. Here we have all these journalists and all these liberals and all these bureaucrats uh, trying to tell you that the, the, that the Freedom Rally was made up of the far right and they're extreme and they had these Confederate and Nazi flags everywhere. Uh, Pierre wasn't buying any of that. He was there. He was supporting them. He was cheering them on. He was saying, this is what we need in this country. And I think a lot of people were really impressed and proud that Pierre was so willing to get out there in front of the issue when some other MPs, including the leader of the party at the time, Aaron O'Toole, was afraid to do that. So I think he's definitely the front runner. Leslie Lewis is another name that's being thrown around. She ran for leader last time around. She was very unknown at the time. People, you know, she was new to politics and she, she really got a lot of support. She ended up winning the vote in the province of Saskatchewan and becoming an MP over in Halton in Ontario. And so she's another person to watch. And then there's a bunch of people that uh, everyone's kind of speculating upon. This might be like a wish list, but people are saying maybe Brad Wall will jump in, Michael Chong. Uh, there's talk of Patrick Brown, who was the mayor of Brampton, jumping in. So regardless of who puts their name forward as a potential leader of the party and who wins, there are two things that the new leader must do that Aaron O'Toole failed to do. Number one, they must connect with the grassroots. They need to get out there, talk to the supporters, talk to the base of the party to know what people are concerned about. What are their issues? What are they worried about? How can the Conservative Party represent them and speak to them and speak for them? What can they do to connect those people. It is just so incredibly important to connect with the grassroots. And the second thing is that they need to be an authentic communicator who believes in and can champion conservative values and conservative ideas. That is something that Aaron O'Toole was never able to do. You must believe in what you say if you're going to lead this party. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show.